All right, so good afternoon. Um, <coughs> I'm going to do a, a less formal talk, a more conversational type of talk. So I don't really have a presentation. I'll be showing you some bits and pieces, but it's really more of a conversation. And what I wanted to do was to take you, in a sense, on a journey, on a personal journey, a personal history of my experiences of working in the museum, and how I got into the digital field, what some of the things that we've done there, and also some of the things that we're thinking about for the future, what, what the concepts are that we're trying to develop um, currently. And I'll try and pick up on some of the things that have been mentioned earlier on today as well, if, so far as I can. Um, I graduated with a degree in geology from Cardiff University some, a few years ago, some years ago, um, and joined the, joined the City of Liverpool Museum, as it then was. Uh, this was a while ago, because at that time, Edward Heath was Prime Minister, we weren't part of Europe, the pound was worth something, what a, what a change, what a, how things have changed since then. And they've certainly changed for me. Because I spent the first 20 years, first of all as assistant keeper of geology, and then as curator of paleontology. Had a lifelong interest in fossils from a, from a little lad, um, which continues to today. Um, I joined the museum in, uh, in the year 7 BC. 7 BC, before computers. Year zero, for me, was 1979 when we uh, borrowed a Commodore PET. I don't know if any of you remember a Commodore PET. Uh, primitive computer, um, 6502 processor, m one megahertz speed, massive 8K memory, which was really spectacular in those days. And we programmed that, learnt Visual Basic, uh, just in the lunch times, as it were, uh, and or learnt Basic, ordinary Basic, and programmed that with an identification key. There were very primitive graphics on that type of machine. So what we did was to construct a frame around the monitor, around the monitor, a little 12 inch monitor like that. And around that was a panel which had things that you'd find in the, in the garden, common garden animals. And alongside each of those, uh, worms, snails, wood lice, um, creatures like that. And then an identification key. Does it have legs? How many legs does it have? Does it have antennae? And it enabled you to identify each of these, uh, each of these animals. I spent a great deal of time programming it um, to create a, uh, like, a, like an, uh, an animation to attract people to it, an attractor screen, which was a caterpillar, uh, which is made out of graphics, um, alph alphabetic graphics. And the, the legs, for example, moved in beautiful waves of motion a vertical, a vertical stripe, forward slash, backward slash. And the programming was so slow, you could actually see this process in the <laughs> thing. And the waves, no, but it produced nice waves of motion. Spent half the time programming it, uh, doing that attractor screen, and half the time doing the identification key. We tried it on the gallery, had it out in the gallery, had about nearly a thousand people use it on the gallery. And we'd logged, um, there was actually a, rec a usage log within it, and we found that the attractor screen never appeared because it was in constant demand. So we knew that these machines, this type of technology, certainly had an appeal to younger people. Because computers in 1979, this was October 1979, they were quite not that common. You know, not many people had them at home. Uh, and there certainly uh, it was one of the first usages in a museum, in a public gallery in a museum, not just in Britain, but in Europe. It was a very, very early. Maybe the second, maybe the second or third one in Europe uh, at that time, and perhaps that's a, that perhaps there's a point in saying that in that our museum, at least, will on occasion risk things and experiment. We've had the opportunity to experiment with things, but in many other ways, we're stuck in treacle, and it's very hard to move, very hard to change. We'll 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 try something, and then oh dear. Not sure about that, and then retrench, as it were. And that's been the, my work experience, in a sense, that uh, we had the opportunity occasionally to break out of that, but we tried to drag people along behind us. It's been quite, s quite slow. Our second one uh, followed quite quickly in 1980, and that was an Apple II computer, and that was built into a permanent gallery. We'd committed to, to um, put in uh, an exhibition in the permanent gallery on the subject of evolution, and that was, again, a quiz type of thing, ten questions about evolution, uh, again, with 
uh, in this case, we had um, backlit transparencies, photographic transparencies from a relay board that I worked with a, with a technician, and he'd built a relay board there controlled by the Apple computer, and that illuminated the, the pictures um, dependent upon the question. And that ran on the gallery, unchanged, um, for 15 years, 15 years and three months. And during that time, we spent £75 on it, on a new power supply. Um, but it was, it, so it went from being cutting edge to, goodness me, have you still got one of those? <laughs> Without doing anything in between, as it were. Um, and when we, when we installed that in the gallery, I did insist that we bought a spare one. Right, that we, we needed a spare, because we didn't know how reliable it was going to be. And it was that spare one that we started the process of documenting the collections uh, with. It was using the spare one there. We never used the spare on the gallery. We, we started to... I wrote... You wouldn't call it a database program, but I wrote a program to capture information, um, you know, keyboard entry and capture information about the geology collections, and got quite a long way through, through that on that simple 8-bit um, computer. That had 32k of memory, which was, hmm. and the 128k floppy disks. If you, do anybody remember those 128k floppy disks? You needed quite a lot of those if you did. Uh, so we ended up with a database spread over about 40 disks or so. Um, that then led on to um, the period in the early 80s, 83, 1983, when we started to do experiments with access to the collections. Um, we'd been doing, e as part of um, uh, International Museums Day, we used to do behind the scenes visits to see, to take people around to see the collections. We have big collections of, of things in the museum, over a, about a million and a half objects in the World Museum, not, uh, natural history mainly, and uh, archaeology and ethnology collections are there. Um, and I appreciated just how, uh, how little people knew about the collections, how little they understood why we had them. And once they understood that we did have them, um, you know, they, they, uh, what, who, who uses them? What are they for? You know, wh why do you have them? That was the question. So we started an initiative which became the Natural History Centre. And this put out um, our collections, some of our collections, into the public domain in an activities room with cabinets, with drawers, um, with some technology, we had a computer there with the mineral database, database of minerals, specimens, 10,000 odd mineral specimens uh, on that. And most importantly, demonstrators uh, who were versed in, the ver in botany, geology and zoology. And they provided uh, an intelligent label in a sense. They were able to react w to people's questions. Um, the, the, uh, the audience for that um, room, for that uh, uh, exhibition, if you like, was pretty much anybody from about two or three year old up to and beyond undergraduate level. So anybody could come in. And I actually remember an occasion when there was a, a lad, a young lad, probably about seven or eight from, from Toxteth, which is a, it's a, not a great area of Liverpool. It's a fairly rough area of Liverpool. Um, uh, and along, and uh, next to him, standing next to him, taking part in the same experiment was the wife of the vice chancellor. There were very few, I knew of no other social occasions when those two would share an experience. And that's, that struck me, that um, there was an opportunity there to um, democratise, if you like, access to the collections in, in, in some way. And it was through the, through the medium of having accessible demonstrators that, that, that lubricated that, that facilitated that. I mean, I used to, in, I used to interview the demonstrators, and I, what I would say to them is, We'd be in a room like this, a bit bigger than this. It was eight metres square. This is about seven or so metres square. And 20,000 specimens round the room. And I'd say, pick something in here. I'm a 10-year-old boy. Interest me in that. And that's what that was their challenge. That was the test that they had to do. And we had people with PhDs in geology uh, come in and just not be able to do that. Because they, they didn't have... They weren't able to put themselves in the position of the 10-year-old the boy, if you like, you know, to, to make it accessible. Uh, anyway, we picked people, we got a good team of people that were able to communicate effectively uh, with a whole range of audiences, and that was, the, that was the mix. Now that's, I've yet to see um, a case where digital technologies are as interactive and, and responsive as that. You were saying about the um, testing the, um, uh, 
the president, uh, what, who was it, uh, Roosevelt, wasn't it? President Roosevelt. Well, that's exactly what I would do. I would test it to the point of destruction, I think, in a sense. Um, but even the most intelligent systems I've seen aren't as good as people at the moment. Now, they will become as good as people in the future, but at the moment they're, they're not in terms of responding flexibly, picking up on, on body language, picking up on signs, picking up on the extent of pre-existing knowledge and so on. Now, so that was the Natural History Center. That opened in, that opened as, we did that as experiments in 1983-84. Um, we thought about it in 1985 and opened it permanently in 1986, and it's been open now since, since 1986. And we get about a quarter million people a year going in there, and they really are people of all ages, all educational backgrounds, all social backgrounds, uh, and it's, it still works. It, it, it works. Um, because you can, you can pick up objects, you can talk to people, you can say, well, what's this? Tell me about this. Or I've got, I found one of these. What, you know, what is it? Type of thing. And we, we, that facility is immediately available. And that's supported by various digital technologies. Some computers, some interactive computers, things like video microscopes and so on uh, are there as well. And we also um, use that as a basis for video conferencing. We use video conferencing in probably three distinct ways. One is to export lessons straight into the classroom, mainly for American schools, in fact, uh, East Coast American schools, because the time in there works quite well. We can do that late afternoon in our location, midday um, on the East Coast of the, of the States. But we've done it to Japan, to New Zealand, which is an interesting one because it's a six o'clock in the morning job from, from our point of view, and it's late afternoon out there. Uh, then it took south, several schools in South Korea as well. And there we take them on a virtual visit to the Natural History Center and we route the video microscopes through the video conferencing unit and we, we allow, they, we put, we, well the way it works is we'll deal with, we'll have a dialogue with the teacher beforehand. They will pick a topic. The class will have a series of questions on that topic. Say it's how do fossils form or insect camouflage or bird flight or something like that. And we will then have a series of objects that illustrate that topic and the children then will articulate their question over the video conference link and we'll use objects from the collections then to, to illustrate that. So it's very much a uh, tailored experience, dependent upon the staff, obviously, dependent upon the uh, expertise of the staff. Um, the other way in which we use video conferencing is to import experiences from uh, elsewhere. We connect up with other museums, aquariums and zoos and so on. Um, again, mainly East Coast American um, institutions, um, Cincinnati Zoo, the Bronx Zoo, um, the Mort Marine Aquarium in Florida and things, and we, we link up with, with those and bring experiences into the theatre. We have a theatre at the museum. Uh, and uh, So that's a way in which we can um, use um, that aspect of digital technology. Now, I've jumped ahead a little bit there because what, what I should talk about now is a project called the Jason Project. That's something that we undertook. We became interested in that in 19, 1992. Our director, um, Richard Foster, um, happened to meet with Bob Ballard. Bob Ballard is the American oceanographer who found the Titanic. He, he was a chap working at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and he, he rediscovered the, the wreck of the Titanic on the ocean floor. And after, when that was publicized, he got 16,000 letters from young people saying, I want to come with you on your next expedition. I want, to, you know, I want to be with you when you make your next discoveries and so on. And he realized that was quite impossible, of course. But what he also realized was that the technology existed to do broadcasts, live broadcasts, via satellite links from his expeditions. And these could be relayed to schools and universities. And they, he could have an audience of 16,000 on every expedition. Now, we took part in, in such a thing in um, 1993 to Baja California, to the Mexico, um, the, sea, the Sea of Cortez, uh, off the coast of Mexico. And we were able to have live pictures from a remotely operated vehicle, an ROV, uh, two kilometers down, entered the ocean there, and we were able to, to drive it over a, a, a frame relay network. We this is before we had the internet, of course, 1992. We actually arranged to have a, a, a frame relay network 
uh, out to the stage, which then went via radio link onto to the ship. And we ran a competition on the local radio to pick some young, young children to, um, we did a quiz on the radio. The winner of that had a chance then to drive this thing. And it had taken quite a while to set all this up, of course. And we were sitting there during the live broadcast, which was also going out live on BBC television. It was going out on news round. So it wasn't just our audience in the theatre, and audiences in the theatre are all over North America. It was actually on broadcast television, network television in the UK. And the little boy who'd won this competition was sitting next to me. 30 seconds before we were going to go live, he said, I want to go to the toilet. Mm -hmm. And I thought, no, you don't want to go to the toilet. Just carry on. But what it, what it said to me was, no matter how good the technology is, and the technology in this case was flawless, if you forget the human factors, you're stuffed. Right? You've, got to, you've got to think of the human factors at all stages. And the, broadca as I say, the broadcast went off very well indeed. It, was, uh, it went out on news round. Um, we had some 40, all together, during the course, do we did the Brisbane project for five years, during the course of which we had um, about five or six hours of national TV coverage on that, which was, yeah, in terms of financial terms, in terms of advertising terms, worth a lot of money. We got sp sponsorship from Barclays Life, from the insurance branch of Barclays Bank, to do that. <coughs> My interest in taking part in that project was really, I think, fivefold. Ballard's mission was to excite young people in science and technology. He, he realised the importance of science and technology in educational terms for the future well-being, economic well-being, as well as intellectual well-being of, of America. And, and the same thing is true here. So we signed up to that mission to excite young people in science and technology. Uh, I felt that such a programme involving live satellite links and interaction with the audience, we were able to put questions to scientists as they observed these creatures on the seafloor next to hydrothermal vents, next to hot, hot springs coming out of the seafloor. Whole communities of animals live in there which hadn't been seen before. <coughs> they were able to make new discoveries and see things that nobody had seen before and to share that in real time with an audience literally looking over their shoulder as they made those discoveries. I felt that that event would attract media attention and that the media attention would attract sponsorship. Uh, so those are the first three reasons. The fourth reason was I really wanted to do something that was technologically based that would begin to open the eyes of my colleagues as to what the possibilities were um, to educate them in some of the uh, technological opportunities that existed or were becoming available at that <coughs> time. And the fifth one was I wanted to acquire some of those technologies for use in other projects within the museum. And it's those other projects that include things like the video conferencing that I mentioned previously, because that was how we were able to, to actually get hold of the equipment, the cameras, the monitors, the switching gear and so on, uh, to do that. And, that, and all that gear was in fact given to us by BT because they'd seen what we'd done with the Jason project and then they said, well, look, try this and have a go at that. We also built that into the conservation centre. We, we used to have the um, uh, conservation centre. We've now closed it down, closed down the public part of it, I'm afraid, because of the government cutbacks. Like all national museums, we've suffered uh, a series of financial cutbacks over the last three or four years, and that's been one of the victims of that, I'm afraid. But in there, we had uh, live links from a theatre, uh, 100 seat theatre, into the conservation laboratories where we could see and talk to conservators working on uh, objects from our collections. And these were you know, a whole variety. It could be anything, really. It could be anything from a, from a, from a mummy to um, a piece of jewellery or a piece of fabric or whatever. And they could actually have a dialogue with that on a big screen in the, in the theatre. So that was one of the, one of the spin-offs, if you like, of that, of that project. In subsequent years, we... Um, we, we did live links from Belize, from the tropical rainforest in Belize, and there was one episode there where we were able to operate a, a camera uh, that would look at the, f the leaf litter on the floor of the rainforest, see uh, a leaf cutter ant, zoom back, lift the whole thing up 45 metres and look over the tops of the trees and, and able to control that from, from Liverpool. Um, and we've got people on the staff who spent half their life trapped traipsing round the rainforest but it never had that perspective in, in one go, as it were. So that was how the technology opened their eyes, really, to an aspect of the rainforest, which they'd simply not been able to experience. 
Um, and then others were then to um, the Florida Keys, the coral reefs off the coast of Florida, uh, to Bermuda, and to um, Monterey, Monterey in California. Um, so that was, a, that was a, an interesting program, good program of, uh, of things that taught us a lot about the technologies. It got us into a field which, when I joined the museum many years previously, I'd just never imagined. I mean, I, I, we had one very fraught time when I'd booked satellite time. You see, these invol that involved multiple satellites from, well, we did one from Hawaii. That involved three satellite links, uh, up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, and at the time, it was the Winter Olympics in Norway, and there was a, uh, a, a grudge match, grudge ice dancing match. I don't know if you remember this, between, is it Tonya Hardin, I think, somebody? Um, she'd been attacked by one of her competitors. And the, the American news services wanted to bounce my book in uh, and take over that to cover the thing. So we had to have these, di had a dialogue with the chief executive of Pan Am sat uh, saying, well, actually, we've made the book in. Tough. <laughs> now, I never thought when I joined the museum as assistant career to geology that I would be engaged in that sort of conversation some 15 years later. So it just goes to show. Um, since then, we've opened up, we've refurbished the World Museum completely. We've got a theatre in there. We've got a new planetarium which was actually given to us by, um, by Zeiss, by, by a nice German company. They'd seen what we'd done with our old planetarium, liked, liked that, and gave us a 150,000 euro plan uh, projector for a new planetarium. So that's, um, that's, that's doing pretty good. Um, in terms of the displays, we've got a variety of interactive displays. One that I'll pick out, for example, it relates to the Maya Codex. This is a document, a pre-Columbian document, probably from about 1490, that sort of period. It's a calendar from Central America. Uh, it's on um, uh, shal um, sorry, calfskin, leather, leather document. But it's a sort of calendar saying what tributes should be given to which gods on which days of the year and so on. Um, one of about 12 such documents that exist uh, in the world. So, you know, really unique well, not unique, but extremely rare uh, objects. And it's a fold, it's a Z folded document. So it's got about 120 pages, of which you can see about three or four at a time, depending upon how you open it. Well, what we have it on display, but then we periodically change which pages are exposed just for conservation reasons. And alongside that is a computer touchscreen that has images, high, high quality images of all the pages on both sides, because it's back and front. And moreover, you can then touch uh, part of that and get an explanation of who that particular character is and what he's doing in that particular image. So that's a way in which we, we've got the actual object there uh, and alongside it we've got the digital representation which in, hopefully enhances that object. That's the point of that. And I think that's one usage of the digital technologies just to illuminate and enhance the, um, the original uh, object. Um, and there are other examples like that around the, around the museum. In our new museum, uh, the Museum of Liverpool, we've probably got, um, well, we've got about 85 computers in there. Um, about uh, tw 28 of them are, are pro projected systems, and the others then are interactive touch screens um, and so on. Um, now, I'm going to show you a little, another little project that I was involved with, that I instigated. Um, this involves a piece of video which I'm going to show you on here. If this works. Let's see if I can find it. I'll turn the sound down a bit. This is a, um, a real dinosaur, obviously, um, as, as you can tell. No, this is a dinosaur puppet, um, a part of a project called Dinomania. Actually, this episode is based upon my experience of taking the dog to the vet. He's, he's got a, a rectal thermometer there, which he's trying to 
get the temperature of the dinosaurs because we don't know whether dinosaurs were hot-blooded or cold-blooded, and he's trying to find. But without success on this occasion, um, exactly the same as taking the dog to the vet. The vet, the dog is fine with the vet until the thermometer comes out, and then he just goes goes berserk. Um, but it is interactive. The op- people can <laughs> genuinely interact with him. Um, what's the little kid now? No, he doesn't. Want <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't want to have a go. Um, But I'm looking forward to the day, I mean, there's a man inside there, clearly. Um, but really, uh, I'm looking forward to the day when we can do this as a robotic uh, uh, exercise. We did plan this with the shop, with the people in the shop. We didn't, we didn't, just, we didn't just go into the shop and create a complete havoc. We, t- we told them we were going to go into the shop and create complete havoc uh, in advance. Um, <coughs> well, this was a program called Dynamania. We also did uh, an evening event, Dino Night at the Museum, and the, 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 along with that, we did a conference, a one-day conference for museum people um, about interpreting dinosaurs to the general public, of which this was part. But during the course of that, we, um, we actually did a video link-up with... I'll just let him... OK, so that's the end of that. There we go. Good. Um, We did a video conference link up with the Museum of Natural History in Los Angeles, which is where I'd pinched the idea from. They they have a program. um, The dinosaur came from Australia. We hired it in from Australia. But I'd seen it in Los Angeles doing a a show there. And we did a link up with them, with the director of theater at the uh, Museum of Natural History in Los Angeles. And uh, she was able to contribute to the uh, to the conference. We had people like uh, Mike Benton. If, if any of you know anything about dinosaurs, Mike Benton is, is a god, if you like. He's, he's the UK authority on dinosaurs, and he was able to come along, and, along with Professor John Hutchison as well, who's also a major deity in, the, in that world, um, uh, and, and museum people as well. So that was the type of... Um, that was one of the projects that we, um, that we did there. Now, what are we going to do in the future? Well. We're going to, uh, keeping on the dinosaur theme, we're planning some years in the, f- four or five years into the future, a new dinosaur gallery. And that'll pick up on something that, that, that you mentioned. Uh, the, 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 the Trabot Simulator, for example, is not too different from one of the things that we're planning. We're planning to have a little Jeep. People go into the, go and sit in the Jeep and go on a dinosaur safari. They'd be in an immersive environment, completely computer generated, uh, and they'd have a mission to go and find a stegosaur and see what it's eating. Uh, and in doing that, they'd have to avoid the, the uh, allosauruses that roam around and so on. Uh, so it's a ju- it really is a Jurassic, it is a Jurassic Park type of thing. That's exactly what it is. And during that mission, they would have to take a digital photograph if, uh, through with a camera provided to them and then email that picture back to themselves as part of that experience. So it'd be a five minute, ex- five minute mission within a wholly digital environment, um, and a completely immersive environment. That's the, that's the concept. That's the aspiration. Another part of that gallery, um, we've got a, a, a wall there, which is, um, how high is it? It's probably, it's probably 22 meters high and about 35 meters across width. That way it's clear, flat wall. And we're going to project onto that um, some images, the, the interaction would be, it could be one of two forms, we haven't quite worked it out yet, but it could be a touch screen which has a pile of bones in it. You select a bone, it'll tell you where to put the bone, and then it's a bone of a brachiosaur, which is a really big type of long, long-necked dinosaur, and that bone then would appear on the life size on this wall. And during the course of a few minutes, you'd build a brachiosaur skeleton at full size. There's a brachiosaur in the Humboldt Museum. I don't know if you, you know the, the, um, the one in Berlin. The hum- Do you know the one? No? OK. Well, anyway, there's a, bra- there's a full-size proper brachiosaur skeleton in the Humboldt Museum there, and it's massive, absolutely enormous. But we can recreate that through the projection. And having g- completed the skeleton, we then add the tendons, the muscles, the soft tissues, the skin, and then it would just walk, out, walk away. It would run away, walk away into the distance. So that's the type of experience, digital experience, that we can create there. The other version of it would have you build in 
um, on a framework, pick, pick the bone out of a box, put it on this framework, electrical contacts in the framework would complete the circuit and that bone would then manifest itself on screen. So you'd have a little template here, if you like, a little, uh, an armature from on which you'd build this type of thing. So that's, th that's the sort of thing that we're um, wanting to do, hoping to do. Now, uh, in terms of the mobile media, I've got a couple of things here, one of which I mentioned briefly earlier on, which is the House of Memories application. You can probably have a good look at this later on. Um, this is about objects from the social history collections, and it's an app designed for two audiences. People who are suffering from memory loss or early stages of dementia or whatever, and they carers, right? And when you start it off, you can pick, are you a carer or do you want to use the thing? And then they can pick objects from the collections and build up their own digital collection on, on the app. So, that, so they construct in their own a little memory box, if you like, uh, there from, from objects. There's about 150 objects in there. Um, and then with the in the carer section, there are uh, in hints and videos, training videos about looking after people with, with dementia. Uh, and that's available, it's called My House of Memories. It's available on um, Android, Play, uh, Google Play, and uh, uh, iTunes store, uh, App Store. Uh, it's worth having a look at that. The other one, which I hoped would play through the projector, but it doesn't, is um, from our art gallery. We've got a Grayson Perry exhibition coming up quite soon. Nice big tapestries. It's his version of the Rake's Progress, and it shows a big set of tapestries, stages in the life of um, this character, fictitious character. But the app, um, is interactive in the sense you can p you can pick a picked character and it'll then zoom in and tell you about that that character there. So it's very straightforward, um, but it's a nice nicely constructed app. That's just called Grayson Perry. Um, so you can have a look at that. Um, the oh yes now in, in terms of my com the comments I picked up earlier on. Uh, See, I've had, there have been two parts to my career in a sense. One part as an ordinary curator, and then from about 1990 onwards, I, I, that's when I set up a new IT department in National Museums, and then uh, subsequent to that, a, a new media department. So I'm looking at th this type of problem from, from both of those perspectives. And I think that the curatorial perspective, and especially the user perspective, is probably underrepresented in your, in your report. I think that's been commented on uh, earlier on. So. Because I think you would get different answers from a group of curators uh, and a different answer, again, from a group of users compared with a group of information scientists and so on. So that's something that I think we'd pick up on. But otherwise, everything that I've heard, I pretty much agree with. Because I think it's all been just wonderful common sense, really. So that's it.